Castillo. Did you enjoy the special? Did you enjoy it? This was phenomenal, and you know, you, I cannot believe how prolific you are, because you've done like three major specials in like, I don't know, three years, four years, and not much time at all. Yeah, yeah. And you're, I mean, it takes comics years and years to build up this much material, but you're also on a full-time sitcom, and you're doing movies and stuff. How, why are you structuring your time so much better than the rest of us? Like, how are you, how are you doing this? I, I don't know, I, well, when I shoot parks, I still am able to do a little bit of stand-up. Um, when I get up early or something, I'll still do stand-up and stuff. But we have like a hiatus from uh, usually from you know like March to uh, like September or something like that. And you know I had one uh, a few months ago, and I was like, okay, well, what do I want to do? And there were a couple of movie things that came my way, but it was nothing I was really excited by. And I was like, I'm just gonna stay in New York and write more stand-up. So I wrote another hour in that time, and and you know. I, I think that's one of the cool things about being able to do stand-up is like you can do something like that and movie stuff sometimes, I mean how many movies come out that are like really good, you right. know, there's, it's, it's, it's hard to find a movie that's really good and then also there's like a part for some Indian dude and then, <laughs> or like a part that they could be like, oh well, let's not make it a white dude, let's make it an Indian dude, it won't fuck up the story, like, because sometimes it, that's a weird thing you never think about, it's like, if I want to get cast in a certain movie, if there's like a white dad and a white, it's like, well, we got to make all these people Indian now, like if we want a season of the movie. So there's all these things. So to find a part that's good for me in a movie I really like, where I can also be in the movie, it's tough. So, you know, in the last hiatus I had, there wasn't anything that really came my way that I was like super excited about. So I was like, oh, I'm going to keep investing my time in stand up because then I develop more material and develop more ideas that will help me come up with my own scripts and things like that. So it just, it just always seems like a good investment of time for me, so I, I, that's why I've always kind of kept it as a, as, a, as a thing in my life, and that's why I've been able to be, you know, prolific and, and, and come up with more stuff. Like, man, I haven't done that. It was weird. Like, I haven't heard that stuff in a while. I haven't performed it in a while, and, and I've, I've written another hour. Uh, oh, I'm, man. It's <laughs> very, very annoying to hear that. But, you know, it's weird to, like, see that stuff, and, like, it, it's weird because whenever these specials come out, I have to like go talk about it, and I'm like, oh well, I'm already like thinking about all this other stuff. Would you, you know, I was I was actually reading something about the Arctic Monkeys the other day, and the, and he he the, is also a very Alex Turner is a very prolific guy, like, the, and the, all their albums are good, and he was like saying that when they go on tour, he's writing new stuff because he's gonna get bored of doing the same stuff. Yeah. Is that, are you that way? Like, do you get tired if you've done a whole tour and you've done those jokes? Does it feel played out for you? Um, in a way, yes. You kind of realize why, uh, you know, you think about like a band like Radiohead or something and like people wanted to play Creep and they're like, we don't want to play Creep right. anymore. And right. I kind of realize that now. Like I realize like, oh, I know why they don't want to play Creep, you know, like because you, right. you want to keep doing new stuff and evolve and like change what you do. Like all in, my favorite- Unless you're Seal, in which case it's cool to do that song. <laughs> Wait, okay. Hey, that's an amazing song. I, if I had a kiss. If I had a kiss from a rose in my uh, repertoire. <laughs> you made me that. love that song, actually. It is a great song. Um, but. Oh, it yeah, is. You, you, yeah, my favorite musicians and comedians and any kind of artists are ones that constantly evolve and change what they do, but still are able to maintain an essence of what, what is kind of unique to them and, and keep that as a through line. And, and, you know, this one's way different than uh, the other two I've yeah. done. And, and the new one I've done, I think, is, uh, you know, Probably a little bit close to, closer to this one than the other two, but it's still uh, I feel like a, a, a change, and, and I think that's those are the artists people really like are the ones that keep keep changing right. things like that. Like I don't know, I, I if I just kept talking about Harris or whatever for every special, eventually I'd be like, all right, man, enough. <laughs> I mean, and Harris is great; he's still fine and does silly things, but you know you gotta you gotta change what you do and keep doing different things and, and try to push yourself. Well, this one does it. This one does feel like you push yourself because it felt like a like a progression, like you were maturing, because you're, all three of them were so funny, but this one you were trying to do a different, it felt like a different kind of funny, like you were talking about your fears, I felt like a lot more, like this is like the three biggest fears in life, like getting married, um, you know, dating, getting married, and having babies. Yeah. That's like the big three. Was, was it like turning 30, was it seeing your friends starting to do this shit, or what was, what was the, and it was also, as an artist, were you like trying to, Think okay now I want to do something more with more unity you know more thematic unity or 
Um, well, I think all my stand-up, uh, the, uh, the writing kind of comes from like, oh, what's really, uh, what's really in my mind? What am I like thinking about? Um, what's really in my head? Uh, what are the fears and thoughts I have? And you know, around when I was writing that special, it was around the time where a lot of my friends were, you know, getting married and having kids. And it, to me, it just seemed like, wow, I'm not ready to do this stuff. And and it just really struck me, like, wow, that's those. These are such huge dilemmas that every single person deals with. You right. know, like every person is making this decision to get married or something. And and it's it, it's so scary to me. And when I started talking about it on stage. I immediately realized like, oh, I'm not the only one that's scared. There's other people that's scared. And that's like a great feeling. And when we all get to like laugh about this stuff, it's kind of like, oh, cool. We're all in the same boat. We're all scared. It's fine. It's fine because we're all in it together, right. you know? And there was no conscious decision of like, oh, I should like talk about something different or whatever. It just kind of happened that like that was kind of what was in my head or whatever. Uh, you know, the first two specials, they're more, you know, random bits and stuff. And there were more things like I was really excited about, you know, like, you know, all my material about Harris, it was like, I'm very excited by Harris. He's a very interesting uh, kid to me. And I, I remember when I first started writing that stuff, I was like, man, Harris is the funniest person in the world to me. If I could <laughs> ever figure out a way to translate what's funny about him into stand-up, that would be like a really great thing. And, and you know, I was able to do that for, the, for that material. And then here, like this special was really like, motivated by like fear like right. this is what i'm scared of and you know in a similar way it's like oh well so many people are scared of this stuff and you know i, I was able to kind of make it uh the the, the themes of the of what the show became one thing I, I read about your process in putting this together i found really fascinating kind of i see you as sort of scientific a little bit in your process because you're sort of like crossing over from comedy to anthropology because oh wow i do well <laughs> i don't say that to everybody <laughs> But uh, you, you did something where, you know, comedians will, you know, go around and play clubs and try out material, but you actually went out to specific demographic groups, like segments, and said, I want to do a show for, like, people in their 20s and in their 30s, and mm -hmm. this show, I only want people over 40 to hear. Yeah. And so you were, like, what did, you, what did your research show you? What did you learn from... What were the differences? What surprised you about the reactions you got? Well, that was more, that was actually for the next hour I was developing. And the reason I did that is like, okay, you know, when I'm working on a show to like tour in like these big venues or whatever, um, I want to test it out in like kind of smaller audiences with like, you know, maybe like 100, 200 people or whatever. And the reason I did that is if you announce a show on Twitter for, you know, 200 seats or whatever, it'll just go right away like it'll be gone in two seconds and the only people that are able to get tickets are people that are just like maniacally watching twitter non-stop right. and so then you go to the show and you're like who the fuck are these people <laughs> that are just looking at my twitter non-stop and we're able to see the announcement two seconds afterwards like, by the way <laughs> th this show sold out in two seconds so see i'm scared i'm good. gonna get murdered later yeah so it's been happening at the festival a lot yeah. <laughs> But so I came up with that email lottery system so people could have a chance if they right. didn't see it right away. And then the demographic thing was because, okay, like when I do a tour in like venues like where I film the special in, there's, there's thousands of people and there's a big range of people. There's single people, there's married people, there's young people, there's old people. So I wanted that 200 to kind of mimic that and not just be what happens to be the, the people that see the Twitter message writer, which generally tend to be like young, single men. So right. it's like, <laughs> right. you don't want to just perform for a room full of those. When you're talking about relationships and things like that, you want to have like a cross section. And also, you know, if you see in that special that we just watched, like there's all this stuff about online dating and marriage and things like that. And a lot of that material came, uh, came about from me like talking to audience members and stuff right. like, uh, you know, I would like interview people kind of on stage. Like I would do, I drop in at like, the, you know, clubs in New York, like the comedy cellar or something. And I would talk to people about like, oh, have you ever done online dating? Like, what was your experience like? What sites did you use? And you know, I would do something like that. And then I would stumble on to like the Jewish in my zip code guy or something like that. And, and that kind of became like my method of researching this stuff. Cause I've never been married. I've never done online dating. So I would talk to people about this stuff. And with the next one, it's been the same thing. 
And so for me, then it was like, so the new show is about like courtship and, and, and how courtship has changed because of technology and things like that. So it's valuable to have older people in the audience so I can talk to them and be like, what did it used to be like? And so that's another reason why I wanted kind of a, a mix of people. But, you know, and, and the, I guess the primary purpose of that whole thing was just to have a, a mix of people that would, would kind of emulate what happens when I tour in a bigger space. One of, one of my favorite bits in the show was um, the five-star restaurant gentleman. And, oh, my God. Uh, and I mean, do you, is that just like, do you just relish those moments when somebody is giving you that kind of stuff? Because you made it into such great stuff. And you're really just, your improv is wonderful. And it's like, oh, thanks. it's a nice mix because your prepared stuff is so brilliant and so polished. But the, I, can, I can just get the sense of delight in you. Like, you seem to be just so happy when somebody starts oh saying, God. I went to Five Star Restaurant for lunch. <laughs> um, it was just, and the breadsticks, the whole thing. It's like uh, that, you can't, I mean, that's just like a, a gift, right? Uh, yeah, that was one of the things when I was filming the special, I was, I was, I was a little bit concerned because that, that whole thing. So, you know, I, I don't know if this is even obvious to people that aren't familiar with, uh, you know, being a stand-up or whatever, but so that special was at the end of a long tour and, you know, the tour show is what, you know, was filmed there. That was a show in Philadelphia that was similar to shows that I did all over the country. And, and every show I would do this bit where I would interview people about the proposals. And eventually, when you do something like that, eventually you get pretty good at it to where it doesn't really matter what the person says. You can kind of make it into a, a funny thing that illustrates the ultimate point you're trying to make. But definitely some are more interesting than others. And when I was filming the special, I was like, fuck, man, I hope the person is good, whoever it is. I hope they're like one of the great ones. And you know, I thought about like, okay, well, maybe if they're like so-so, maybe at the end after the encore, I'll interview a few more people about their proposal things, and then these motherfuckers showed up, and I was like, <laughs> what? It was. It's honestly one of the, if not my favorite one of all the proposal right. stories. Like, definitely like top three. Like, I couldn't believe it. I actually, I was in Philadelphia uh, a, a few weeks ago. And I was doing a show at some college or something. I was staying at some hotel, and like uh, I was going up to my room, and uh, you know, uh, on one side was the rooms, and then they had like a business center. And this woman was like, "Oh hey," and I was like, "Hey," and she, I was like, oh, "Hey, how are you?" And she's like, "Hey, it's good to see you." And I was like, "Oh, cool." And I thought she was just someone that you know recognized me or whatever. And she's like, "You don't remember me?" And I was like, "Uh," and I was like, "Holy shit! It was the proposal lady." <laughs> And she just happened to be at the hotel and I was blown away. But man, every time I watch that, I'm just like so thankful that worked out. Cause, Cause another thing is like, you know, sometimes you'd have crowd work things in specials or like when you're recording a CD or something and it doesn't quite translate, you know, cause there's something about the energy of being in the room. But luckily for some reason that one, like even though it's like a film thing, it, it still has that energy and, and I'm really happy that worked out. So you're, you're becoming uh, something of an expert in this field of court, courtship and uh, <laughs> I'm relationships. Not, I'm not an expert at all. Oh, I think you're like... I'm a, I'd like to think of myself as a curious bozo. Okay. <laughs> so like Malcolm Gladwell or something like that. Well, that's cool. But, but I think like you, you, um, you I read that you're, you're writing a book. You're writing a book about yes. relationships. Yes. What is the nature of this book? What is well, it? so the new show, like I said, is about like courtship and, and, tech, and technology. how technology has changed that and just, just how like courtship has totally changed in the past, you know, 10, 15 years or whatever. And so I would read all these articles and stuff like in that show, I read articles about like arranged marriage and things and I just found it to be interesting and it kind of helped me develop material. And when I was writing this new show, I would try to look up, you know, research and stuff uh, about um, the topics I was writing about in this. like. You know, the topics in the new show would be like something like, um, you know, uh, okay, so like when you text someone, like if you're romantically texting someone and then they take a while to text you back, like why does that affect us so much? Like why does that wait, like waiting to hear someone, why does that affect us so much? And like is there an optimal time to wait to where like you hit that point where you like, where the person's like, ah, and then they hit the message, like, whew, like is it like, why is that a thing? I was like, well, there's got to be some research that's been done about like why that affects us and like how our happiness levels change depending on how long someone takes to write us back. 
And I was like, whoa, I can't find anything. And, and like a few more things came up like that where I had a question and I would look it up and then there would be nothing. And then I was like, man, why isn't there like, you know, a Malcolm Gladwell type or like Freakonomics type book about being single now? That book should exist. And then I was like, holy shit, I should just try to write that book. Right. And, and, and you are a that's, scientist. That's what I've been trying to find. Well, no, I, I mean, the, the idea of the book is that I would uh, meet people that have been working on this different right. stuff that are, are really smart, and then I would just like bother them with questions, and that's then good. we would write an interesting that book. That is journalism. Then. Yes, that's what journalism, that's what journalism is. is. Well, it's I gonna... was a journalism minor, so. <laughs> oh, there you go. You got that covered. <laughs> got to say, the journalism minor program at NYU, very rigorous, <laughs> very difficult. <laughs> If you're thinking about going into the journalism minor at NYU, be aware, you're going to have to take at least two courses. <laughs> I, I still have a hard time picturing you at the Stern School of Business where you, you attended. It, it's so what bizarre. Was, how, how long did you last there? I did the whole program. Really? I was a marketing major, which is very easy. So I didn't. Well, I but didn't you really were also much. minoring in journalism. That's that was true. A, that was a big load. It's quite a workload. Yeah, it's a load. I, I remember I was in the, like I met with my advisor sometime. Like I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I never, when I was young, I never knew what I wanted to do. I didn't have like a dream job. I wasn't like a young kid who was like I want to be a comedian. Like I had no clue. I grew up in South Carolina, and the idea of becoming a comedian seemed, you know, that wasn't a thought that ever passed my head or being an actor. It doesn't pass your head when you're in South Carolina. And um, it doesn't, because you're like, that's not what people in South Carolina end up doing, right? Like, you end up farming. So uh, I went to NYU, and I was like, well, maybe I'll uh, go to the business school. Maybe I'll start my own business. You know, that seemed like it, it had a lot of freedom. I could figure out what I want to do. And it, it, you know, it was a big umbrella of business, right? And then I get there, and it's like all these kids majoring in finance, and they're like all about like working at Goldman Sachs and stuff. And I was just like, wow, I hate everyone I'm going to school with. <laughs> these are all horrible people. What did I sign up for? What am I doing? And I and I immediately like started looking in to transferring into Tisch. And then at Tisch, they're like, well, you got to put a for for for. Uh, they were like, you got to put put a portfolio together. And I was like, oh, I'm not doing that. And <laughs> I just stayed in the Stern School, and then I was like, "Well, what's the, what's the like the the only mildly creative thing was marketing?" And I was like, "Well, I'll I'll just do marketing." And uh, you know, I remember I met with my advisor, and they're like, "Well, you're gonna just do marketing? You're not gonna do finance or accounting or anything?" And I was like, "No, I'm happy doing just marketing." And then I was like, let me throw that journalism minor on top. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I pretty much just coasted through school. I, and I started doing stand-up like the summer of my freshman year. And I remember I was sitting in some class. Like, I'm, I don't know why it was this particular moment, but I was sitting at some, in some class my sophomore year with some like marketing class. And I was just like, this is so dumb. And I was just like, man, you know what? I think I can do something with comedy. At the least, I think I could be like a touring club comedian, and I would be so thrilled to do that over any like office job I can imagine. So I'm gonna at least do that, and I'm just gonna coast through school and just be done. Cause I didn't want to like quit school and like have that whole conversation with my parents. Like all these like people like drop out of school. It's like it's a pretty good deal. Like your parents are like paying for you to go to school and shit, and like live in this nice city. Like why, why would you be like enough of this? <laughs> It's so good. Like, you, what was I going to do, quit and start temping and get into a huge argument with my family? Like, no. I just, like, kept going to school, somehow graduated with honors doing nothing. And then uh, by the time I graduated, I had enough stuff going on in stand-up to where I was like, oh, I'm just going to do stand-up. What was, what, what was your parents' reaction? Like, if this, they hadn't grown up with, you know, seeing you as, like, an aspiring, like, showbiz guy in South Carolina. What, what happened? I guess you said that your dad remains resolutely unimpressed by your achievements. Oh, yeah, right? that's like, That will yeah. never change. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Did he want you to be a doctor like him or no? He didn't want me to be a doctor, but that's like, I think that's just a thing with like right. Asian Indian parents. They're Push. very hard on you yeah. and they're like really, and which is probably good. It probably makes you fucking work hard, but you know, <laughs> and every now and then a pat on the back wouldn't hurt. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but um, you know, when I first finished school, I think when you first start out in comedy, it's such kind of a weird thing in that you're, you know, uh, a parent wouldn't be familiar with the, with the markers of like success and things like that. So it's kind of hard to be like, oh, I just opened up for Patton Oswalt. And then they're like, okay. And then, uh, but, uh, you know, eventually 
when you, you start getting magazines and things and when you start being on TV, then it becomes a much more tangible thing and then they get on board and then by the time you're on TV and they're people they work with, they're like asking you for autographs and stuff like that, I think then it becomes like an exciting thing for them. You so know? they're they're happy now, even though. Yeah, they're happy now. I mean, I, yeah, the, I, I, they'd see me do stand-up a few times and then uh, the first time, uh, the, in the special before I did this Dangerously Delicious, when I did that tour, I did Carnegie Hall and, uh, and I flew them out for that and they'd never seen me do like a big theater before and, and I was like, man, this must be pretty crazy for them to see like 3,000 people like go crazy to see me like talk about my dick for an hour. <laughs> 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 I don't do, that's not my act, but you know, I said that for, for the laugh from you guys just now. Uh, right. Now, I, we're gonna um, ask, uh, open the, uh, the floor up to questions in a minute, but I just wanted to ask you one, one last question because it deals with the thematic material of your special. And I want to do a little bit of crowdsourcing too because I know you're very into that kind of research. I, I love getting into conversations with people about okay. this stuff, sure. All right, so my, my observation is um, what I know of you is that you are a very kind person. Oh. So well. I think you would be an excellent husband and father, in my opinion. <laughs> In my opinion, um, does the, what does the audience think? How many, people, what, how many people in the audience agree with that assessment? You're getting something. <laughs> that was a very Who muted response. Like, I don't, I don't think like, this guy I'm not, so, I'm not so sure they agreed with the kind part. I, I like, don't, they were just like, they were just like eh, maybe. Yeah. I but was the really husband and father thing, the whole special is about how I would be terrified. No, but you see, I think you're protesting too much. I think the reason why you're so, I don't want to be a psychiatrist or anything, but I think, you're, I think you value, I think you, you see how important this stuff is. You're scared of having like a baby because you see how important that is, what an important job that is. You know, the, I think, that, I think you, you are onto something there because to me what's so surprising is like everyone, to me what's interesting is that everyone decides they're going to get married. Everyone decides right. they're going to have kids. Stupidly. Yeah. But, but, but how does every, th those to me seem such huge decisions. How does everyone, how can everyone be so sure they can have a kid? How is everyone so sure they, they are good enough to raise a child in this world? To me it seems like you would have to really think about that for so long and I feel like so many people are like, well we've been married for a year, let's just bone it out and have a kid. Like, <laughs> You we know? see. I think when you talk to your scientist friends, your colleagues, I think a lot of them are going to say that the DNA is overriding all of this. That we, as a as a you know species, are ha are programmed to reproduce, and so we convince ourselves that that you know that Jew in that zip code is the right one. And, yeah. And then we do it, and then bam, there's another Jew in the same zip code. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> I just think. I just think that that's a huge part of it. We convince ourselves that we're sentient human beings and we're making these decisions, but you've just given it a lot more thought than some of your friends have. Maybe. But, but let me ask you, and then we'll, we'll take some questions. Can you see a scenario where you could get married? Yeah, I mean, of course. I think, uh, I guess, you know, even when I wrote that special, that was a few years ago, you know, when I wrote that material and developed that stuff, and, and you constantly change and, uh, you know, you know, being like a single dude and, and going out and all that stuff, all that shit gets old and like right. eventually you will get to a point where it's like, well maybe I should bring a life into the world and experience that, you know? Uh, so I don't know, I, I think at some point I will probably pursue those things, but you know, there's also people that don't do that stuff and they right. seem very happy. You know, I have friends that are married and they don't have any kids and they seem super happy. I also have friends that have kids and it, you see this amazing joy it brings to them. And so, I don't know, I, I, I'm always like very much of the mindset of just kind of play it by ear and, and see how things go. So, you know, maybe at some point I'll, I'll want to do that stuff, but I don't know, we'll see. Okay, well, fair enough. You answered that fully. Um, <laughs> any more, any questions? We have a microphone up there. Why doesn't, I'm sure some of you have some questions. My only- oh, um, brother requirement of the questions be that they actually be questions. Uh, sometimes in the New Yorker Festival we get very long observations and comments that are uh. with a little thing at the end tacked on, it's like, do you agree, Aziz? Uh. Uh, so let's actually go for questions in question form. What's yes. the first time you remember being funny? What's the first time I remember being funny? I don't know, I always remember like as a kid just, um, uh, just liking when I was able to make people laugh, you know, like I always enjoyed that. Um, but I don't remember like a particular instance, but I remember even like as a very little kid, like, you know, enjoying making people laugh, but 
uh, you know, I don't remember a specific instance, but I've always enjoyed making people laugh, and even if I wasn't a, con a comedian or anything, I think that would be a part of my life is, you know, being a humorous guy or whatever. Yes. Next question. Okay. So you devoted a lot of your material to child molestation. Well, not a lot. That depends on your... <laughs> And, and, and the whole, I, I like, thought not enough. That was my view. And through a good bit of it, I was just going like, mm, uh, ooh. Mm. But, the, but then you were like, and you just felt sorry for the child molester. And, and like, I was just like, you made everyone feel bad for laughing at that. And that's fucking hilarious. Oh, thanks. So I'm just, I'm just like, what goes through your head when you're approaching material like this? Well, I mean, I can tell you how that bit kind of came about. Okay. I started thinking about, okay, why am I scared to have a kid? Why does that scare me? Mm -hmm. And then I just started thinking about, like, well, God, it just seems like I would constantly be worried about the kid. I would be worried. Anytime I wasn't with the kid, I would be worried that something horrible could happen. And then I had the thought of, like, man, I started thinking about my mom letting me run around. And, you know, I'd seen, like, these, like, photos of me as a kid where I looked like this cute little kid for some reason. And I was just like, man, I should have been getting molested all the time. And then, <laughs> and then, you know, you just start talking about it on stage. Like, I would drop in at places like the Comedy Cellar or something, and then I would just kind of just explore those ideas on stage, and then it ends up becoming uh, the bit you saw. I mean, that whole bit, you know, it's a silly thing about child molestation, but it's ultimately about like, oh, I'd be scared to have a kid because it's a scary world out there. And I, I, how, how do people have that bravery to let their kids out? You know, that's it's scary to me. Yeah. Cool. Have you actually never sent a dick pic? I never have, no. I have ne never done it. But isn't that so crazy? Like, th that was a really surprising thing to me. I, I, and, you know, in the news show, too, I've done things where I ask the audience questions and kind of do these kind of in hyper-informal polls, and it's always interesting to me. Like, that, uh, that whole, like, uh, clap your woman in the audience, clap if a guy's ever sent you a dick pic, uh, I was stunned at how high a percentage it was. Everywhere I went, it didn't matter what city I was, and this may just be in my own head, but I think as the tour went along, the percentage increased as, <laughs> like, by the end of the tour, it seemed to be, like, 90-something percent. It was so bizarre. Well, there's still time for you, so. Yes, maybe, maybe I'll meet that special lady that I want to send a photo of my dick to. How do you come up with the names for your comedy tours? How do I come up with the names? Um, well, let's see. Uh, the first one, that was just, like, kind of, like, a random collections of, of bits, and, and, uh, and I like, like, I liked the, I was looking, thinking of like how I wanted the, the album cover to look like, and I like these kind of older, like R&B album covers, and so that's kind of how I made the photo look, and then for the title, Intimate Moments for a Sensual Evening, just kind of sounded, <laughs> sounded like a good name. And then the second one, I was writing some article for something, and I, I wrote the phrase, dangerously delicious, and I just liked the way that sounded, so I kind of, I, I called that one that. And then this one, uh, whenever I was uh, coming up with a tour poster, I had a poster that looked like these old, like, magician posters. Uh, th it was like a cool kind of artwork they used to do for these old magician posters, and um, I made my poster look like this one particular really famous uh, magician poster, um, this guy named Thurston, and uh, I was trying to think of a title, and Buried Alive kind of sounded like a, ma a magician show title, but it also kind of fit in with the themes of the show, and so that's how I landed on that. And this new one, I, I haven't been able to come up with a name that I'm 100% behind, but we'll see. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, I think it's Thanks really so much for being a woman that wants to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, I think it's funny that you brought up anthropology because I think, you know, a good comedian is a good anthropologist. And um, I think that this is kind of, it looks like this is a part of some sort of growth in talking about these sort of like, I don't know, not scientific, but social issues. Like, I mean, you know, you made it weird and stuff like that. Like, I've no, 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 th that's a podcast. That's... That's a thing, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> like Pete Holmes, yeah. Yes. And uh, I just, what do you think, where do you think that this whole sort of social analysis in comedy is going, and what do you think that you have to contribute to it? Where do I think it's going? I mean, I can't speak to where it's going. I mean, I can only speak for my, my own self, but, um, uh, you know, the, the new show I'm doing, I think it's even more of what you described than this one. And uh, to me, it's just interesting to, to speak about these things and... Uh, 
it's weird, like uh, doing comedy shows every night and like speaking to audience members, it becomes like a weird way of like interviewing people and you learn interesting things. And uh, you know, I, I, I can only talk about the things I'm dealing with in my life. And so in the news show, when I talk about like, you know, what it is to, to deal with courtship in this era and, and uh, you know, speak to audience members about it, I feel like you have like an interesting uh, position to kind of learn about it. And then hopefully with the book, it'll end up being a more kind of academic way to do it. But um, with comedy, I think, you know, comedians kind of, uh, you know, really good comedians give you a good uh, picture of where the culture is at and, and what people are going through. And, and you know, hopefully, hopefully that's what some of my comedy does. Thank you. So your presentation was so polished. Um, and I was wondering, how long does it take you to you know, get the rhythm and get the cadence and get the voices and get the songs and get, get everything at the, same, at the right pace? Um, well, you know, to like write a whole hour like that uh, can take anywhere from like eight months to a year, depending on how busy I am with other stuff. And uh, so usually what I do is I'll like drop in at smaller clubs in New York and LA to kind of start getting together material. And then when I have like 45 minutes or so, I'll start doing kind of club dates in, in cities where I, I'll do like a smaller club that's like 100, 200 seats and just get it to like an hour or so. And then um, I'll start doing the hour show in smaller places. And then uh, eventually I'll book like a big tour when I feel like it's really good. And then, uh, you know, over the course of the tour, you do, you know, 30, 50, 70 dates and, it, you know, it evolves and it becomes like a pretty tight thing. And, it, it, you know, by the time I like announce a tour and announce a string of dates, it's pretty close to being a pretty tight, you know, one man play. Uh, you know, obviously not as strict as a play because it's a stand up thing, but, you know, you have all the bits and you have the structure and you know that the kind of flow and everything works and uh, and by the time you finish it and you're you're ready to film the special I film the specials usually you know on the last leg of the tour or whatever it's it's become a pretty honed thing Hi Hello So you have all this talk and this whole next show um, based on courtship and dating and is it not just an elaborate ploy to get a date <laughs> Um, no, it's not. Uh, I do okay, but I, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's just interesting to me that like everyone goes through these same foibles and, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, well, you know, people recognize you from TV or whatever. Isn't your experience totally different? And yes, it is to a certain extent. Yes, if I, if someone maybe recognizes me, it kind of opens the door a little bit, but eventually you, you just become a person. It, to me, it's like, I always say, it's like, okay, if I drop in at like the comedy cellar or something, when I drop in and people don't want to be there, they're like, oh shit, I can't believe it, blah. But after a few minutes, you know, and you know, when that happens and then for the first few jokes, people are like very on board, they're so excited you're there, but eventually that fades and then you just become a person and you have to do your shit just like anyone else. And it's the same way, with dating stuff in a weird way. It's like, yes, okay, yes, it may help open the door and like someone's uh, more interested to speak to you or whatever, but that's just the same as like being like a super attractive guy or a girl. Eventually you just become a person and you end up dealing with the same shit everyone else does, you know? And to me what's interesting about this stuff is like, uh, you know, when I, when I talk about things in the show of like texting someone and asking them out on a date and then getting silence back and not hearing anything back, like that's something so many people can relate to and that, that's what's interesting to me. Spoken a little bit about how you made the choice to actually do this special, and there weren't other offers coming in that really piqued your interest. But how are you kind of prioritizing things going forward, and how do you make those decisions? Like maybe I want to, you know, continue on this sitcom, but only for a few more seasons, or I want to do more stand-up. I guess what drives those priorities at this point in your career? I guess it's like what I had the most fun doing. I have a lot of fun writing stand-up, and I find it really fulfilling, and I love touring. So that's what I'm uh, doing right now. And you know, Parks is still fun, and I've been doing that. And uh, I mean, I think that probably the next thing I do, uh, non-stand-up wise, will be something that I, I've written that has my viewpoint and uh, is, is my writing. Because I don't know, it's weird doing like another, like I love Parks and it's really fun and I love that group and everything, but it's not my show. It's not the things that I'm talking about, you know? Uh, so my goal would be to do a thing after Parks that's like, 
an acting thing that has my ideas and stuff in it, and uh, you know, and I'm going to keep doing stand up as long as it's a fulfilling thing. So I had a question about the um, social anthropological views that the penultimate woman asked, but I'll just pass that because I think you asked that, you answered that already. So um, my question is more around then. I'm just going to wing it. What is it you think that drives you in terms of your passion? Because you you talk about comedy as something that just is something that makes you happy. Do you think that just doing what makes you happy is the most important thing? Or do you think that it's just what you do that makes you happy? That, that is too deep. <laughs> I really don't think that's an appropriate question. That was really like a philosophical question that no one could ever answer. Ever. No, 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 I got this. No, you you got it? it? You I got, got it. this. Come okay, you can as I said, it. you're a scientist. So. Here's my answer. I have no fucking idea. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, never ask that question again of anyone. <laughs> um, we, we have just time for like one more question. Okay, this is our final question. <laughs> oh no, there's, all the th there's like three more people. I know, but just maybe they off. could, you know, Don't maybe, make the, maybe they could all, look, let her ask questions and then have those three confer on a question that they can jointly ask. How's just that? ask three, just be, let's just be really, I just feel like yeah, it's kind ben. of a dick system where you let them line up. Hey. You could have like been like, don't line up anymore. We'll, well do it really quick, so go ahead and ask your question. Welcome to the New Yorker Festival. Go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, just lightning round, yeah. You talked a little bit about being at NYU, and you talked obviously a lot about dating. Could you talk a little bit about dating at NYU? Because dating at NYU? I just graduated from said institution, and the dating scene is at best mangled. Um, to mangled. me, at least. I don't know what it was like for you. I just, I, you know, I, I wouldn't even be able to properly comment on it because I think the whole dating culture at colleges has changed tremendously since I was in college. I graduated in like 2004 and I still perform at colleges and stuff and it's so bizarre. Like it's such a different uh, landscape because of, you know, you know, things like Tinder or whatever. So I, I, don't, even, I don't even know how the fuck to deal with anything. Uh, basically what I'm saying is I feel horrible for you. I do too. All right. Okay. Let's go, guys. I tried to throw you a bone. Let's keep I, it going. I was going to ask you why you are interested in talking about gay marriage and all of these causes that are very important to you and where do you see you know, comedy and its force in galvanizing social change. But her question is way better. Oh, OK. <laughs> I'm one of the, first of all, I'm one of those crazy married people with kids you talk about. But no, um, I don't think you're crazy at all. I think you, I, I very much admire your um, decisiveness. You mentioned um, you mentioned dating um, white girls, um, and I was just wondering. I'm here with my single Indian friend, and we were just wondering, do you also date Indian girls? Um, because she is an Indian in your zip Why are you other people wooing? <laughs> it's like I like that dating the same ethnicity. I'm into it. In your zip code. In your oh, um, uh, no, I, I've dated people of uh, many ethnicities, and uh, I'm not a racist person. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Oh, no, Aziz. this little kid. No, he's with them. He's oh, with go, them. Go, 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 it's go, all right. Go. Oh, wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Oh, okay. Thank you, everybody. Let's hear it for Thank Aziz. You so much. We're done. <laughs>